grew up in the 1980s. I played soccer, video games. I loved Star Wars and Back to the Future. I listened to Wham, Bruce Springsteen, and Michael Jackson. I remember I had this cassette tape of his album Thriller that was on constant repeat in my Brown Fisher Price tape player. It was your average U.S. American suburban childhood. But I guess one thing was particular, and that had to do with where we lived. See, I grew up in Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. On the 4th of July, we'd drive in for the fireworks at the Washington Monument. In December, we'd visit the Christmas trees on the Washington Mall. Happy day after Easter. In the spring, we'd attend the annual Easter egg roll on the South Lawn of the White House, a big event where I met my heroes, people dressed up as Superman or Spider-Man. I remember they signed a little wooden egg for me. When family came to visit, we'd take them to the Smithsonian, the Natural History or Air and Space Museums. Now, from Television 9, Washington's news station, this is Eyewitness News Weekend. Morning news about things on Capitol Hill seemed local, not national or even international. For us, Washington was local, accessible, tangible. It wasn't some symbolic place across the country or the capital of the, quote, free world. It was just down the street, the place where my school teacher mom met my bartender dad. Close family friends worked at the Pentagon. One of my best friend's dad, he flew Air Force One, you know, the president's plane. In high school, my civics teacher tried to get a friend of his to come speak to our class. His name was Ollie North. You know, the top Reagan official wrapped up in the Iran-Contra scandal. This might seem spectacular to people living in other parts of the country, but it was just part of life near Washington, D.C. You know, like the auto industry in Michigan or Ohio, like coal mining in Kentucky or West Virginia. Almost everyone in our area had some connection to Washington or the U.S. government. Even my grandma back in the late 40s after graduating as valedictorian of her high school class, but before marrying my granddad, she worked as a secretary for about a year at what was then a new government agency, the CIA. That's the thing. Growing up, even though U.S. government buildings were close enough for me to touch, the actions taken by the United States abroad felt as distant and abstract as the countries themselves. I knew where Canada and Mexico were, but Central and South America was just an alphabet soup of exotic places that seemed a million miles away, color-coded shapes on a map that appeared to have nothing to do with my suburban childhood or the United States or my family's backyard of Washington, D.C. Boy, was I wrong. I only began to wake up when I went off to college and then started to travel. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast, because even growing up on the outskirts of Washington, I was oblivious to the deep role the U.S. has played historically in the hemisphere, the tremendous harm it's caused across Latin America throughout the past 200 years. And I know I'm not the only one who was in the dark. This is Under the Shadow, a new investigative narrative podcast series that walks back in time to tell the story of the past by visiting momentous places in the present. This podcast is a co-production in partnership with The Real News and NACLA. I'm your host, Michael Fox, longtime radio reporter, editor, journalist, the producer and host of the podcast Brazil on Fire. I've spent the better part of the last 20 years in Latin America. I've seen firsthand the role of the U.S. government abroad, and most often, sadly, it is not for the better. Invasions, coups, sanctions, support for authoritarian regimes. Politically and economically, the United States has cast a long shadow over Latin America for the past 200 years. In each episode in this series, I will take you to a location where something historic happened, a landmark of revolutionary struggle or foreign intervention. Today, it might look like a random street corner, a church, a mall, a monument, or a museum. But every place I'm going to take you to was once the site of history-making events that shook countries, impacted lives, and left deep marks on the world. I'll try to uncover what lingers of that history today. 
My journey through Central America starts in Tapachula, a few miles away from Mexico's southern border. In the rest of the series, we'll travel through Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica to reach, finally, Panama. Along the way, we'll pick through the ashes of a U.S. invasion and retrace the footsteps of filibuster William Walker, you know, the gringo American who invaded Nicaragua and took over the country in 1856. Yeah, crazy. We'll visit a U.S. military base, the site of former United Fruit Operations, and memorials for the dead and the disappeared, the victims of bloody U.S.-backed regimes. In each episode, I begin in the present, in a specific location, detailing the sights and sounds now. Then, in those same places, we descend into history, like taking an elevator to the past. Actual time travel. Or as close as we can get to it without a flux capacitor and a sleek 1980s DeLorean. But to set the stage, this episode is going to be a little different. Today, I'm starting way in the past and walking forward to understand how this all got started and why this series is particularly important now. Like how past U.S. actions are literally still having an impact today, not just on countries abroad, but inside the United States itself. This is Under the Shadow, Season 1, Central America, Episode 1, The Beginning. Monroe and Migration. Two hundred years ago, on December 2nd, 1823, under a dark, moonless sky, then-President James Monroe delivered his State of the Union address to Congress. In his address, Monroe lays out what would become both one of the most consequential and devastating ideas for Latin America. It would be called the Monroe Doctrine, an articulation of the United States' sovereign right to bend Latin America to its will. And the U.S. would repeatedly cite it as a perennial warrant to invade foreign countries, overthrow leaders, and police the Americas. At least that's what it became. But that wasn't the idea in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, other countries have statements. We have doctrines. You know, that's the thing. That's historian Greg Randon. I teach history at Yale University. And I'm the author of a number of books, the most recent one being The End of the Myth. He's also the author of Empire's Workshop, which looks at Latin America's role as a testing ground for U.S. imperial strategies. So basically, the, the language of the Monroe Doctrine, it was scattered throughout this larger, many thousand word speech. And it was very vague on what the intentions were. I mean, you know, basically... Summed up, it said that, quote, unquote, the free and independent nations of the two American continents were off limits for future colonization by any European power. And Monroe let it, let it be known that any effort to, quote, unquote, extend Europe's system to any portion of the hemisphere would be viewed as the United States as a threat. That's like the core of what we think of as the as as the Monroe Doctrine. It was actually a pretty simple idea. Europe, stay out of the hemisphere. Remember, by 1823, most of Spain's former colonies in the Americas had just won their independence. But at the time, the Monroe Doctrine was celebrated by Latin Americans, by independence leaders. One, they were happy that the United States seemed to finally come out of Latin America, Spanish American independence. That was a huge thing. I mean, the, the, there was still a couple of big battles left before Spain finally gave up completely. But the more important thing is that they read in the Monroe Doctrine a corollary to their own anti-colonialism. They didn't read it as a doctrine of neo-colonialism. They read it as a doctrine as anti-colonialism, that, you know, no part of the Americas is, is eligible for reconquest. That, you know, they saw it as, as, as analogous to their own anti-colonialism. So there was a lot of um, celebratory messages to Monroe from Latin American leaders, thanking him for the, you know, not the doctrine, but for the pronouncement. This is important to understand. Remember, at the time, the U.S. was still small. Settlers were paving their way across the country, violently pushing indigenous peoples from their land. But the United States was far from an empire. 
In fact, like its newly independent Spanish-American neighbors, the U.S. had also freed itself from empire and monarchy only 40 years before. We need to understand that the big division at the time wasn't U.S. Latin America. It was the division between republics and monarchies. That's Marixa Lasso. She's a Panamanian historian whose research has focused on the Panama Canal and South American liberator Simón Bolívar. This is what people understood at the time, and this is really important because we take it so much for granted, the idea of being a republic, that we forget how radical it was the early 19th century, how fragile it felt for protagonists like Simón Bolívar, how new it was. Think about it. Only the U.S. was a republic, and then all of these Spanish-American new republics. France was not a republic anymore by then. And then you had also Haiti. So <clears throat> it was new, it was fragile. In 1826, Simón Bolívar convened an international congress in Panama, which at the time was still part of Colombia. Representatives came from most of the newly independent Spanish nations. One of the items on the agenda was, ironically, the establishment of the Monroe Doctrine as a guiding framework against threats of reconquest from Europe, and in particular, Spain. For this podcast, I visited the location where the conference was held in Panama City. The convent where it took place is gone, but a large statue of Simón Bolívar stands in its place, in a little square down by the waterfront, and across the street from Panama's Ministry of Foreign Relations. Bolivar's dream was to unite the countries in some sort of federation. It failed for far too many reasons to discuss here. Just three years later, Bolivar is quoted to have said, the United States appears to be destined by providence to plague America with misery in the name of liberty. Prophetic words. The U.S. grew, expanded west, killing and removing indigenous peoples from their lands. The United States invaded Mexico, captured Mexico City, and took more than half of the country's land, what is now today most of the western United States. It was only the beginning. Greg Grandin. As time goes on, the Monroe Doctrine becomes more of a doctrine of, as I mentioned, informal empire, mandatory power. And this is explicit with Theodore Roosevelt and his corollary, which says, you know, Monroe Doctrine basically gives the United States the right to police the hemisphere. The great fundamental issue now before our people can be stated. That is the voice of President Theodore Roosevelt. Unfortunately, there are no recordings of him delivering his 1904 State of the Union address when he made this addendum to the Monroe Doctrine, or what's called the Roosevelt Corollary. The full text, however, is pretty shocking. We asked a voice actor to read an excerpt. Any country whose people conduct themselves well can count upon our hearty friendship. If a nation shows that it knows how to act with reasonable efficiency and decency in social and political matters, if it keeps order and pays its obligations, it need fear no interference from the United States. Chronic wrongdoing or an impotence which results in a general loosening of the ties of civilized society may in America as elsewhere, ultimately require intervention by some civilized nation. And, in the Western Hemisphere, the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States, however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence, to the exercise of an international police power. 
In other words, certain circumstances may force the United States to the exercise of an international police power, no? to protect the world from the general loosening of the ties of civilized society. Those are his words. Professor Marix Alasso says that 1904 speech is a justification in many ways. What happened in Panama, which is that he supported the separation of Panama from Colombia and then taking control of an area of the isthmus. That was just the tip of the iceberg. U.S. interventions ramped up across the region. The list of U.S. invasions, occupations, coups and sanctions is endless. Hundreds from Mexico to Panama, the Caribbean, Colombia to the tip of Chile and Argentina. No country in Latin America has remained free from the shadow hanging over them. The shadow of the United States, the shadow of the Monroe Doctrine. In this season of the podcast, Under the Shadow, we'll look particularly at the United States in Central America, the outsized role of major U.S. corporations like United Fruit, the U.S. support for bloody dictators and authoritarian regimes, the overt and covert steps taken by the United States to overthrow democratic or popular governments, and the impact on local communities. The legacy of Monroe and U.S. intervention in the region runs deep and it hits much closer to home than you might think. In 2023, Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! ran a show on the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. She asked her co-host, longtime journalist Juan Gonzalez, to connect the dots between Monroe and the exodus of people from Latin America to the United States. Yes, Amy. Well, it's it's precisely the implementation of the Monroe Doctrine and the creation of what essentially became uh, the birthplace of the American empire in Latin America uh, that uh, resulted in so many people from the, uh, Latin America coming to the United States, especially in the late 20th century and the beginning of this century. And a lot of people don't understand that relationship. And in fact, it's precisely those countries in Latin America that the United States uh, once intervened in, occupied, uh, and uh, executed regime changes in that have produced the most migrants uh, to the United States. Uh, So there's a direct relationship uh, between the empire the United States built in Latin America and the migration crisis uh, that we continue to uh, face here in this country. This issue is really important because it's constantly ignored, sidelined, and omitted. That's why we need to underline it, highlight it, and start with a red pen. In the second half of this episode, I'm going to take you to meet migrants walking north toward the United States on the edge of Central America. A very real manifestation right now of the never-ending impact of the United States in Latin America. That in a minute. Hey everyone, Maximilian Alvarez here, editor-in-chief of The Real News Network. We're going to get you right back to the program in a sec, I promise, but really quick, I just wanted to remind y'all that The Real News is an independent, viewer and listener-supported grassroots media network. We don't take corporate cash, we don't have ads, and we never ever put our reporting behind paywalls. But we cannot continue to do this work without your support. It takes a lot of time, energy, and money to produce powerful, unique, and journalistically rigorous shows like Under the Shadow. So if you want more vital storytelling and reporting like this, we need you to become a supporter of The Real News now. Just head over to therealnews.com forward slash donate and donate today. It really makes a difference. Also, if you're enjoying Under the Shadow, then you will definitely want to follow NACLA, the North American Congress on Latin America. NACLA's reporting and analysis goes beyond the headlines to help you understand what's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean from a progressive perspective. 
Visit NACLA.org to learn more. That's N-A-C-L-A dot org. All right. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. I don't know if I've ever been so overwhelmed by a story I'm working on. Like just the, the, the complex mixture of so many different cultures here in Tapachula. <clears throat> the people leaving their homes, looking for a better life, hope, 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 hope. And at the same time, so much pain and despair because there is such a long way to go. And even at the end of that road, it's not even clear if they're going to be able to achieve or get what they're, what they're fighting for and what they've been traveling so long for. A Venezuelan woman with two kids walking for two months to arrive here to the border. And then people waiting, <clears throat> sometimes months, particularly in the case of the Haitians, to, to get the visa to travel through the country and, and they might even be turned around once they get up the road. Haitians, Venezuelans, Guatemalans, everyone with their own cultures just trying to get by. It's, it's really intense. This is a place I was reporting from recently, Tapachula. It's a town in southeastern Mexico, just across the border from Guatemala. It's complicated and tumultuous. Hundreds of thousands of migrants have passed through here just in the last year alone on their journey north in search of the American dream. Tapachula is at the crossroads between Central America and Mexico and the United States. But it's also at the intersection between the past and the present. It is perhaps the best location in the Americas to understand how U.S. intervention in both the recent and distant past is directly impacting the lives of countless people up and down the hemisphere in real time today. I'm in front of the main Mercado in downtown Tapachula, and there's just a mass of people. Haitians are out in the streets. People are cutting people's hair, selling water, selling cigarettes, changing money. Every, it's just a huge multitude of cultures. Mexican, Guatemalan, Salvadoran. Everyone fighting to get by and fighting to start the road north. Tapachula is really important in understanding this phenomenon as a migrant, both transit point and a sort of air, open air prison. That's Arturo J. Vizcarra. I am an immigration attorney. Actually, I say asylum attorney, uh, licensed in the U.S. And I've been working in Mexico for the last five years with migrants from Central America, Haiti, uh, Venezuela, and other parts of the world. He says of that time in Mexico, he spent almost half of it in Tapachula. It's very hot and humid, right? It's the, the, it, it's, which is, I, I think, contributes to the sense of desperation uh, in the air, right? And I read somewhere there was the most popular or the most transited point in the globe for migrants, or at least one of them. The lines at the migratory agencies are out the door. People are waiting for visas and papers to travel, so they don't just get sent back here to Tapachula or deported back to their home countries. It's a vicious cycle, and it's playing out across the city as countless migrants try to navigate what Arturo Vizcarra calls bureaucratic barriers. It kind of becomes a way station, a place to rest, and make your next move, right? Now you've, you've made it to Mexico. It's the last country you have to go through. But it's still a huge and dangerous journey before you, or expensive, right? And the Mexican government, along with the U.S. government, have also just made it kind of an open-air prison where they bog people down in Tapachula. <laughs> In front of one of the city's few migrant shelters, tents cover the front yard and side streets. A small group of migrants are camped out under a gazebo on the edge of a park, alongside a river and across the street from a major supermarket. Maria has been here for weeks. 
We're going to use her first name here, as well as that of other migrants in this story, in order to protect their identities. Maria is Honduran, 33 years old, intense dark brown eyes. She wears tiny earrings in the shape of the cross. Her long curly hair is pulled up over the top of her head. She looks both beautiful and exhausted. Her two young boys scramble over her. One of them holds a pink plastic toy gun. My life is in danger, she says. I've denounced it with the police, but they're waiting to kill me. My children are in danger, and that's why I've left Honduras. In 2022, she made it all the way to the U.S. border before she was caught by U.S. Border Patrol guards. She was detained for a week. She says they told her they weren't accepting Hondurans, and she was deported back home. There, she collected her kids, and now she's trying again. There's no future in Honduras. There are too many gangs, too many crises, she says. I did what I could to survive there. Some days I ate, some days I didn't. I cried, so did my kids, because I didn't even have the money to buy a small bag of salt. So I'm looking for a better life for my children. And with God's help, I'll make it. Maria says she's waiting to receive her humanitarian visa in Mexico. Once she has her papers, then she and her kids will continue the long journey north to the U.S. border. There, she says she wants to do everything right to request legal asylum in the United States. But it's all a really slow process, and there's no promise that she'll even get it. This is really stressful. Sometimes I cry because I don't want to be here in Mexico, she says. I would love to be on the road, but I can't go without papers, because I know that without papers, they'll just grab me and deport me back to Honduras. Everyone is desperate and tired of waiting. Tapachula has a way of sucking you in, migrants say, grinding you down. The wait can be long and tedious, and many just want to make a run for it. Caravans are leaving like once every couple of days with hundreds of people as they work their way, they leave down the highway and work their way north. And it's the constant stream of these caravans, and the question is how far they'll actually get. Caravans like this. The bulk of travelers on this road today are Venezuelan. But there are people from countries across Latin America and the globe. They're still in Mexico's southern state of Chiapas, but about a day or two hike up the highway from Tapachula. We've been walking from Colombia, Venezuelan migrant Alexis tells me without breaking pace. Walking, asking for rides, praying to God that we arrive all right. Up the road, 20-something Exxon and two friends are ahead of the pack and making good time. The dream is the U.S. border, he says, with God's will for us and those who are behind us. The phenomenon of the caravans started about five years ago. Through the rain, scorching heat and humidity, thousands of migrants make the perilous journey through southern Mexico, hoping to reach the United States. It's been called the largest Central American migrant caravan in decades, and thousands more migrants are joining, fleeing dire conditions in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. That was 2018, when migrant caravans traveling through Mexico became headline news and an endless source of political hysteria throughout the U.S. midterm elections. But those weren't the first caravans, and they certainly weren't the last. We barely hear about them in the media today, but countless caravans of people are still traveling from Tapachula and marching through Mexico. Professor Adrian Pine is the author of the 2020 book Asylum for Sale, Profit and Protest in the Migration Industry. The vast majority of migration, especially if we're talking about migratory flows north um, in the Americas toward the United States, is a result of U.S. foreign policy. And it, which U.S. foreign policy we're talking about differs depending on the state. But regardless, it's all harmful. It's all displacing people. And it's all rooted in U.S imperialist capitalism, right? It's U.S. using its military occupation of many countries in Latin America and its military and other um, war threats. As we'll look at in the coming episodes, Central America has been ground zero. Whether it was U.S. support for genocide in Guatemala or for the authoritarian regimes in El Salvador in the 1980s, 
or the 2009 Honduran coup. Each of these events, um, some of them short term, some of them long term, were followed by massive waves of people fleeing the violence, the U.S. led violence in their countries, um, fleeing and going to the most obvious place, which is the United States, which, of course, ironically caused that violence in the first place. So you have, in some cases, this sort of direct U.S. military intervention, um, or in other cases, you have instances where the United States is very friendly with a government, um, but that's only because the government is, you know, bowing down to the U.S.'s demands. The main reason I left my home was because of the violence, says a young Honduran migrant from this mini-dock on the caravans from a few years ago. His words echo those of Maria and so, so many others. You can't go out. I graduated, but there was no work. And actually, in 2018, you had just had fraudulent elections in Honduras, right, at the very end of 2017. And some of those migrants were actually very politicized, were very much saw themselves as fleeing the Honduran regime, uh, which was, you know, just a continuation of the 2009 coup regime, even though this is eight years later. Quick refresher course. Angry protesters at the doorsteps of Honduras' presidential palace want President Manuel Zelaya back. In 2009, the Honduran military removed the country's democratically elected president, Manuel Zelaya, from power. The United States adamantly backed the coup. I'll dig into all of this and the aftermath in depth in episode six. But for now, let me just say that the U.S.-backed coup unleashed a series of repercussions, including political repression, spiraling violence, cuts to the social safety net, government corruption, and rising inequality. Honduran migration increased only a few years later. In the wake of the 2017 elections, repression against protesters was reminiscent of the crackdown after the coup, fueling a new exodus. Hondurans are still usually the number one uh, Central American population that is going through. So apart from the political stuff, there's obviously the violence of uh, the state, the violence of uh, criminal organizations, in this case, uh, the gangs, and of course, economic uh, violence and, you know, inequality that has been prevalent for a very long time in, in the region. It was not the first time that U.S. foreign policy or intervention deteriorated the situation inside a country, resulting in increased migration toward the United States. In fact, although this is barely ever talked about, the United States itself is at the root of much of the so-called migration crisis the U.S. has seen in recent decades, and which former President Donald Trump, among many other prominent public figures, continues to use as political fodder. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They're pouring into our country. Nobody's even looking at them. They just come in. Uh, the crime is going to be tremendous. The terror. That was him in December be. 2023. And we built a of the wall, and then we're going to build more. Arturo Vizcarra. Then there's just actually looking at the actual policies, the military invention, the propping up of dictatorships, the violence people were fleeing. But then there's just the economic policies that have continued to be, you know, mostly dictated by the U.S. Then you have to come to, you know, you should come, you should come to the realization that the U.S. bears a ton of the responsibility for why people leave these countries. And uh, yet uh, we can't have really have a, an honest conversation about that. Yet the vulnerable people that are migrating are the ones that are blamed for it. And it's, and it's absurd, and it's cruel, and it's lazy. Of course, the vast majority of those I met in Tapachula or walking northward today are Venezuelan. They're fleeing very real, disastrous conditions and financial hard times. The United States and most of those migrants blame the Venezuelan government. 
But Adrian Pine says if you look at the actual figures, the reality is quite different. It's only following Obama's sanctions that Venezuela goes from being a migrant receiving country to being a net emigrant country. Those sanctions began in 2015 and were ramped up under Trump. Uh, there was a study by a CEPR, by the Center for Economic and Policy Research, that found that in just a few years, they found, I think it was 40,000 excess deaths that were directly attributable to U.S. imposed unilateral coercive measures or sanctions. So sanctions are war. They are killing people. And people are fleeing those. And you can see that very directly in the statistics. I traveled to Venezuela in 2019 to report on the impact of the sanctions. I was there during the attempted coup. The reality was devastating. Shortages on medicine, HIV drugs, food, car parts, countless products, all in large part because of the sweeping U.S. sanctions. So it's a direct result of the sanctions that you see Venezuelans leaving. And of course, right now, the, the phenomenon that we're seeing of Venezuelans coming north is primarily Venezuelans who had already spent many years in other South American countries and had experienced tremendous xenophobia, violence, racism. Of course, this podcast is about U.S. intervention in Central America, not South America. But I really wanted to highlight this connection. In 2022, 2.76 million people tried to cross the U.S. border. In 2023, more than half a million crossed through the treacherous Darien Gap. That's more than double the previous year. The Darien is a jungle no-man's land between Colombia and Panama, the gateway to Central America. A week or more on the trail through dense, hot, and wet forest alongside hundreds more, all fighting to survive. And many don't. Travelers face violence, extortion, robbery, and kidnappings. Migrants told me it is hell on earth, living hell. You pass dead bodies, says Venezuelan migrant Genesis. She walked through the jungle with her seven-year-old daughter. It's traumatic, she says. There are people begging for help, and you can't stop to help them. I never would have done it if I had known. Thousands are risking their lives every day, braving it all fleeing violence, threats to their lives and crises, often unleashed by the United States, all for a shot at the American dream. The United States has done its best to close the door. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris. I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. The U.S. is increasingly criminalizing the very migration that it helped create in the first place. Even as Washington pushes rhetoric of addressing root causes of migration in Central America, it's really just rehashing the same stories that have caused so much harm over and over again. In the 1980s, the U.S. funneled millions of dollars into Central America in the so-called fight against communism. Today, it's dressed as fighting drugs or gangs. And the security aid, together with economic policies favoring foreign extractive industries, only increases inequality and makes things worse. I have one more place I'd like to take you before I go. In front of the Tapachula Town Square is the City Museum. It's in a large, three-story colonial building that overlooks the movement of people outside. Upstairs, there's an ongoing exhibit on migration. It is surprisingly powerful. As you walk in, it's like the museum is taking you on the journey of a migrant as they travel north toward the United States. You pass images of people on the road, pictures and words. The voice of young migrants speak in the background. You wrap around the room, and when you get to the close, there's a large tree with drawings and written notes left behind by largely migrant children. 
por violencia, narcotráfico o amenazas. They're all written in Spanish. I hold my breath as I read the words. My name is Arol, reads one of them. The words are written underneath the children's pencil drawing of a pair of animals walking. I traveled through the jungle many times and I saw robbers who took our money. I miss my people who came with us. I'm going to the United States, he writes, but I don't know where. I came to Mexico looking for asylum, but now I lost my family, another note says. A sad face is drawn beside it. I'm from El Salvador. I'm 40 years old. Now I don't want to go to the USA. I'm traveling through Mexico looking for my wife and two kids. It wasn't worth it. What I most miss about Venezuela are my uncles and aunts and abuela and abuela. My name is Dulce and I'm from Mexico. It makes me sad everything that everyone has to go through because I was also a migrant in the USA once. Yes, you can, Ecuador. Yo soy de Honduras. I'm 13 years old. I like sports, I like soccer and basketball. I've had a really long day, really long, really stressed, and I'm tired. Their words are a heartbreaking window into the reality of life on the migrant trail. Life upended, as we learned in the beginning of this episode, with the help of the United States. This museum exhibit is a type of living display of historical memory. That's a name given to the collective efforts, particularly in Latin America, to breathe life into the past, to remember the history, to visibilize it no matter how devastating or painful. In this case, that past is only days or months old. It's still living on in Tapachula or on the highways north. I'm bringing this up here because, as you will see in the coming episodes, this podcast is rooted in historical memory. Throughout this journey through Central America, I look to history to understand the present and vice versa. You could maybe even say this podcast itself is its own memorial to the past, but I'll let you be the judge of that. And here's the thing, as you probably already know, U.S. intervention is not a thing of the past. You're welcome. I think the debate is over. In late November 2023, Congressman Kevin McCarthy, former Speaker of the House, attended a debate of students at Oxford University in England over the pros and cons of U.S. intervention, past and present. He begins, We all know American intervention is good. It's not perfect. Our nation is not perfect, but we strive to be a more perfect union. The great thing about with innovation, with intervention, you're allowed to learn if you've done something wrong. But the great thing about America is we change. We take the tradition of the past and we apply it to a changing future. I think people up and down the hemisphere would have something to say about a statement like that. The U.S. failures at intervention have ruined countries, destroyed families, killed thousands, perhaps millions. For those on the receiving end of Teddy Roosevelt's big stick, American intervention is definitely not good. And some people in Washington know it. Military interventions kill, displace, and starve civilians. Often economic interventions do too, as we are experiencing and seeing in many of our neighborhoods across the U.S. On the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine, there are renewed calls to bury it, even on Capitol Hill. As we will see in the coming episodes, U.S. intervention and the Monroe Doctrine have taken a devastating toll, and the wounds are just beneath the surface. In the next episode, I'll take you to the Guatemalan town of Tikisate, once the center of operations for United Fruit Banana Production in Guatemala. I'll look for signs of that past in the present and walk in the footsteps of the 1954 CIA coup that would overthrow a democratically elected government in defense of U.S. profits abroad. That is up next on Under the Shadow. 
Before I go, I wanted to thank everyone who pitched in to make this podcast a reality. In particular, Judy Hughes and the Sawyers. Without their support, you would not be listening to this podcast right now. I'll read a full list of all those who donated to Under the Shadow in the final episode of the podcast. The theme and closing music is from my band, Monte Perdido. We're releasing a new album in a couple of months. You can find us on Spotify or in the show notes. Lastly, if you like what you hear, you can head over to my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash M-F-O-X. There you can support my work, become a monthly sustainer, or sign up to stay abreast of all the latest on this podcast and my other reporting across Latin America. Under the Shadow is a co-production of The Real News and NACLA. I'm your host, Michael Fox. See you next time. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.